Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Soul Row Show. I'm Cherie Burton. This is a podcast where ancient feminine wisdom meets the modern path of soul evolution. Even though this is a charge controversial topic, we're starting to see the impact of adverse religious experiences and even calling it religious trauma. It can be really pivotal for somebody who, let's say, comes from a high demand religious background or high control religious background to tune in to their own frequency and their own selves when they are in alignment as they see fit and in integrity with their own authenticity and inner voice. And so it can be a fine line and it's a spectrum even when we're talking about deconstruction. There's so many people in religion who are nuanced, who maybe don't necessarily believe every little thing, but they're still actively attending all the way over to completely divorcing themselves from the system, removing their records, or even going into fundamentalist atheism. For our intents and purposes today, we want to help people restore their dignity when they have questions, to uh, be able to navigate the challenging journey of deconstruction, and really to just give permission to be curious and to question and to honor one's mind and heart on this very sacred journey that we call life. Dr. Laura Anderson has a PhD from Saybrook University and is a licensed marriage and family therapist. She specializes in complex trauma with a focus on domestic violence, sexualized violence, and religious trauma. Her best-selling book, When Religion Hurts You, Healing from Religious Trauma and the Impact of High Control Religion, offers a very compassionate guide for those on the path of healing and liberation. I have read her book. I have marked it. It has been validating, and I have referred it to people who are in deep, deep pain around deconstruction and reconstruction. I hope you enjoy this episode and always love to hear from you as we continue to explore these topics in more depth, not in an effort to stigmatize religion necessarily or to take people off that path if they feel called to it, but just to have everyone come together in awareness and understanding about some of the shadow aspects of these systems. Follow me on Instagram at Cherie.Burton and ask to join our private Facebook group, Soul Rose Community, as we explore, validate, support, and inspire each other on this individuated path of spirituality. Dr. Laura, not to be confused with the other Dr. Laura. Yeah, that's a good one. (laughs) Hopefully. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was telling you before we started recording that I followed you on Instagram for a while and I was like, oh my gosh, awesome. And then I found out you had this, when did your book come out? It was recent. October. Yeah, just October of 2023. So not even a year ago. Yeah. Yeah. And its title is When Religion Hurts You, Healing from Religious Trauma and the Impact of High Control Religion. So in there, you share your story. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I appreciate very much about this work and your work in general is that you offer neutrality. While we're talking about deconstruction, there is no one right way. There's no you know, and so I loved that you were able to come in and you're, you also have, you know, psychotherapy background. And so you just come in with a different perspective. I love the mental health perspective. I want to start with, first of all, how would you define a high demand religion? Yeah. So maybe this is my next thing that I need to do is come up with a very succinct definition. I don't have one, but I would say any sort of religious system or institution that is controlling the aspects of your life, taking away your own voice, choice, and autonomy, and replacing it with theirs, their own set of rules about your life, the way that you live, act, dress, interact, relationships, sexuality, how you spend your time, money, energy, resources, things like that. In the very back of the book, I give, I call it the religious power and control yeah, wheel. Yeah, yeah. And I I give several areas and examples of a high control religion. And so it's more of like a concept that I'm giving versus a a definition. And, and that kind of helps people understand like what the concept of, of that is. And so maybe I need to come up with a more succinct definition, but that's usually what I say to kind of give that overview of this is what a high control religion is. I've got it right here. So I love that you put it conceptually rather than just a true definition and kind of put you on the spot there, but (laughs) so so the components are isolation, minimizing, denying, blaming, Mm -hmm. emotional abuse, spiritual abuse, threats, accusations, and intimidation, economic control, sexuality, and gender defining and loss of autonomy. Mm -hmm. And some of those are really powerful, like direct, bold, I don't want to say accusations, mm-hmm. this part about threats, accusations, and intimidation. How do you see high control religions doing that? It's kind of covert, right? 
Yeah, it can be very overt or covert, but we usually see it more covertly than anything. So I'm just kind of pulling this open here. And some I give a bunch of examples in the book. Yeah, because have... it's like, what struck me with that one was the threat of abandonment. Yeah. Like, so you will be abandoned mm -hmm. if this, yeah. yeah and and it's not an... It's not like they're coming out and saying you'll be abandoned, mm -hmm. but that's the underlying message. Yeah. So it could be, you know, there's an expectation that in order to be a part of the group, you must follow these rules or you must abide by certain theological doctrines or b a belief system. And if you don't do that, there are consequences. And sometimes those consequences have greater or lesser degrees of connection or disconnection that could result all the way to things like excommunication, disfellowship. And that unto itself can be scary. But for a lot of people, they know that that consequence also sometimes means you, quote unquote, lose the protective covering of the church. When that happens, I know for me, I was told, that means that the devil can kind of get his hooks in you. And that's a very scary place to be. For other people, they're told that means you likely could go to hell or, you know, kind of be spending eternity in a place of eternal conscious torment, depending on the religion that you were a part of. So it's a threat then that you are carrying. So if I do these things, if I kind of go outside the lines that have been drawn for me, there's some very serious consequences. So the threat is used to keep you in line. We might not ever know if they could actually do anything, but the threat is there. You know, I use things like the simple fear of going to hell. I know that for children in particular, that can be very, very scary, especially because oftentimes these types of threats are coming from parents and caregivers that are also attached to love. And, and so you go, okay, here, my mom, my dad, my grandparents, my older siblings, these people that are nurturing and, and giving care to me are also the ones that are saying there's this place of hell that I could go to. Yeah. And so that feels very scary. And so I have to do the things that they're saying that, that I'm supposed to do because to disobey them would be to sin against them. And sin means that I could go to hell, right? As children can't really conceptualize yeah. all of that, but they can conceptualize disobeying my parents means I'm sinning and sinning means I go to hell, right? So we look at it that way and we go, okay, that is tactic of control. We start controlling children from a very young age, especially when we're born into it. You know, there are people that absolutely can come into these systems of religion, but there's many people I know yourself included, myself included, that were born into this. So there was never a time where we didn't have messages like this or this sense of threat that was present. It was yeah. ever present. There was never yeah. a time we didn't know it. For me, part of my angst as a child was that there was some being, God, micromanaging every single thing, thought, yeah. interactions. What I said, like, I felt that there was this like you said, if there's the fear and the love together, and I didn't quite know how to read, mm -hmm. you know, and the underlying belief that I internalized, which I feel like is pretty prevalent in high demand religions was that I am not acceptable as I am. Yeah. That I yeah. have to do certain things to earn this approval yeah. from a divine creator. Yeah. And, and so it created this angst of like hypervigilance and monitoring and journaling ad nauseum and repenting and, and all of these things so that I, I could just get right with God. How yeah. does that impact the psyche as one progresses? Absolutely. There's a term that I use in the book called religious scrupulosity. It's a form of what we might also call religious OCD. So this idea that I always have to be doing something to kind of prove my worth. So I, I shouldn't be going out with my friends. I should spend that time praying. I shouldn't be, you know, having fun. I need to spend that time reading scripture because there's always more that I could or should be doing to be working out my salvation. Mm -hmm. I think when you start with a basis, like in your theology, this foundation of I am bad or I am sinful, I'm inherently unworthy. 
which I know that's where I started. I know there's some denominations or religions that maybe don't start with that basis. I think most of us, most do start with some sort of iteration of you are inherently bad and you need a savior to come save you from your own badness. When you start with that as the basis, which means like you don't really even deserve the air that you breathe, you're having to effort constantly to do something to make you worthy. And even though there's this savior figure that supposedly covers all of that, they tack on this idea of sanctification. You're supposed to work out your salvation to show that you're serious enough about this salvation. And so it really does mess with you. If you're quote unquote serious about your faith, it means that every aspect of your life should be revolving around your faith. So yeah, you have some free time. Do you really need to be watching TV or should you be spending that reading scripture? And or- it, you know, it keeps you from the state of like deep relaxation, a quiet mind. Yes. yes. And it disassociates you from whatever's yeah. happening at the time yeah. in favor of devotion or obedience. Yeah. And it really keeps your nervous system on a high activation alert. You're always having to be on guard, hyper vigilant, looking around. Is there something that I need to be doing? And it keeps you in a space of them being in a place of control, them being like the high control religion, the leaders of the church. You're always needing to be ready to go for them. You know, I need to be doing, I need to be expressing. And it comes like, it's hard because we recognize how valuable service to others is. Right. As a mother, you know, I started having kids and trying to be the perfect mom and the perfect devotee and all these things. I recognize that my self-care was not where it should be because I was literally taught to lose myself in the service of others. That was always yeah. reinforced to me yes. and that they would pull like biblical quotes about Jesus saying, whosoever shall save his life shall lose it, you know, yes. take, you know. And that was kind of twisted to be about religious devotion. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it just, there's a busyness to it. Yeah. There's a, like you said, that highly activated nervous of what should I be doing? Yeah. All the time. All the time. Yeah, absolutely. I remember like I would even have days off. So I worked actually was paid out in staff at the church that I went to. And even my days off were never actually days off. I would spend them with students doing volunteer work, you know, with the same students that I was actually being paid to work with, you know, I'd be in the Christian bookstore looking at curriculum and reading books and, you know, all these things. And it was just, there was never actually a moment of truly being off. I couldn't, I was so terrified. Like I couldn't even read books that weren't affiliated with religion, you know, and it was very even hard for me to read a book that wasn't the Bible because- That was any, I mean, even though they were religious books, it was like the Bible is even better, you know? So why don't I just spend my time doing that? You know, it's just, and, and what that does then, of course, is it creates not only this echo chamber, but it just, it's like an information control piece, which is a cult tactic. Like a bite model, the bite model, behavior, information, thoughts, emotions, right? Yeah, absolutely. So it's just, it is this control thing. So when you say like, how does that impact you? It is like making your life very tiny and it's controlling. So every aspect of your life is put into this box and it's all controlled by this institution essentially. Yeah. So I think the pushback from people who are devoutly religious, and I would have put myself in this category for most of my life, It's that what I'm not being controlled. I feel so good here. Right. This is such a pure and holy, you know, Mm -hmm. organization. And why wouldn't I devote myself, my family, my time to that? And how would you respond to that? I mean, I would have put myself in the same category. I mean, this was my life, my identity, my everything. Whenever anybody says like, how would I know? Like if I'm in a, a group, to that. I can't be the determiner of if this is good for you or not. Sure. But I would say if you tried to leave, what would happen? And that to me is very telling. Or if you tried to disagree, if you pushed back and said, but that's actually not for me. I still want to show up. I want to participate. I want to do it. But that thing, no, that's a no for me. Or no, I don't want to 
wear that. <laughs> I'm yeah. gonna wear this over here, right? Like what would happen? Or you know what? I'm taking a break. I'm not gonna do this anymore. I'm gonna, you know, whatever. Yeah. What would happen? Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we actually then start to see the true colors come out and what is actually happening in that group. I think and we yeah. yeah. Sorry to interrupt you, but it just reminded me of Stephen Hassan, I think is his name, who came yeah. up with the bite model, who wasn't a cult. And he, yeah. and we don't like to use that word cult because I demand religion and cult. There's a fine spectrum there. So, you know, but anyway, he talked about how, you know, you're in a cult when you can't leave with your dignity intact. Yes. And yes. I very much experienced that. I would always, I would never say I was leaving. I was just saying, I'm taking a sabbatical. I need to regroup. I need to recharge. I've got things yeah. going on. I having these dissonant feelings. I have questions that aren't being served here. Um, mm -hmm. It's not safe for me to raise my hand and say the things I'm saying, to bring it back to yeah. love, compassion, and mercy. There's too much justice. So, so yes, I physically experienced that feeling of mm -hmm. losing my dignity to this community. And it was very, very painful mm -hmm. because I, I had this, I guess, ego attachment to having a certain identity within that community. I was rewarded for my faith. Yes. And so to come into a place in my life where it was maturing in my spirituality and looking at other things, it was just like, this is the one way. Yeah. And if you don't adhere to this one way or these teachings or this leadership or this mm -hmm. counsel or this doctrine, then you are off path. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember when I was writing the book, the one thing that my editor was like, you need to flesh this out a bit. She was like, what is the difference between a high control religion and say a sorority or a club or something like that, where they value, you know, similarity, you know, you think about like a sorority and they all wear the same outfits yeah. or, you know, something like that. I was like, oh, well, hell, that's the difference. You know, it's the consequence, <laughs> the consequences of if you're different, right? Like if you wear something different at a sorority, you might get kind of like nose up snubbed or whatever, but you're not going to hell for that. Right. And it's that piece. It's the consequence. It's the being shunned. It's being judged. It's that your dignity is stripped of you. It's that you are seen then as a dangerous person and yeah. removed from the group. You know, when I wrote the book, I was not afraid of people saying, but not all churches or not all Christians. I was like, I'm afraid that people that I used to work with, go to church with, that they're going to start telling the same stories that they told when I left of their version of why I left. Because to like it, discredit you and not under right. yeah. yeah. And I know the stories that they were telling. None of them were true, not even a, like yeah. remotely true, you know, but at the same time, that's what they do to kind of strip the dignity in order to bypass discomfort or having to look at themselves to say, what is actually happening here? They tell their tales and bear their testimony. Right. So that they don't have to actually deal with, wow, this person who was kind of the poster child for, you know, what we were all about is walking away. We should look at ourselves. Why did that person walk away? Why did that person say, I can't do this anymore? Yeah. I completely resonate with that. When I was in the depths of I would say kind of a, a betrayal trauma, finding about certain narratives that were untrue and going to public you know, records and actual historical documents and even stuff that was on the church website. And I like lifted the lid and I went into the shadows of it and I sat with it and I'm like, oh, that's why I was having discordant feelings about this. So I was trying to integrate, you know, my felt experience in my body with what I'd learned intellectually about yeah. the truth of, of some of these things. And it was really interesting when I did take that sabbatical that no one asked me what I was learning, how I felt, yeah. no one. And when I went into my bishop's office and explained some of the things I was learning, he wanted to give me a blessing. He wanted to bear his testimony. And if I would just read the Book of Mormon, and if I would just read and study and fast, that it would be okay. And so that projection of his where he was at was put on me. And I said, I've never, ever studied, prayed, fasted, you know, been in more of a humble state in my entire life. And so it was just like 
people would be assigned to me to kind of come activate me. And I had these ministering sisters who would sit. They were very kind, but they were very uncomfortable to discuss what I was learning. And I didn't want them to know either, but I was just craving somebody, a family member, some of my faithful family members even to come in and ask me because I thought naively, innocently that they would want to know. They would want to know. But what kind of the catalyst was my older children in their 20s kind of doing their own embodied somatic work and learning psychology and learning to honor their feelings and emotions, which is what I raised them to do. But, oh, don't question this thing. And they, independently of me, had their own awareness and awakening. I do have a child who had religious scrupulosity, who was literally trying to be perfect. And it was really killing this child, killing on a mental level to where this child came to me and said, I'd rather go to hell or the lowest in Mormonism, it's the lowest degree of the glory, which is called the telestial or the telestial or terrestrial. He's like, I would rather go to the terrestrial or telestial kingdom than feel the way that I feel right now. I would rather sacrifice because I'm in hell right now. I'm in hell right now. I really started to listen. And I think that's the missing interpersonal skill with people who are religious adherents bless their heart, the best people. At the same time, there's a bypassing of the shadows or an, oh, well, it feels so good. It can't be. The shadow is, you know, and it's like deep listening is the skill that they are not really, they want to pour their love on you and love bomb you and bring you back. And it's all based in fear, the love that's coming at you. And you know that, and it's like, just listen, just deeply sit with me and there's scriptures about mourning with those that mourn and comforting those that need, stand in need of comfort. But when it comes to this, when it comes to really listening to the soul and mourning and comforting them, they have to stay in their own internal safety is to reinforce their beliefs to you rather than really listening. Yeah, I think that's a form of denial. And I mean that in like a coping mechanism way of like the way I describe denial is that it's a defense mechanism that we use to keep us from seeing things for how they truly are, because if we did, it would feel consciously intolerable. So I think of it as if you were to be in a, a carriage in the park that a horse is, is pulling, they have those blinders on their eyes. All they can see is what's in front of them. And that's so that they don't get distracted and spooked. And, you know, and so they keep pulling the carriage straight forward. And so many of us in religion, we do that too. We have these blinders. We can only see what's in front of us, what's being taught. That's a little bit like denial. And when we come to them, with, hey, this is my lived experience, or this is what I'm learning, or this is what I'm feeling, that's very hard to take in. It means that those blinders open up just a little bit. If they were to see that, that would feel like too much. That's too, it's too scary. It's, it's too big. It could feel consciously intolerable. I don't know what to do with that information. All that they might have available to them is to say, no, Absolutely yeah. not. I cannot go there. And, and so we have to shut that down or deny it and say, that's not right. That's of the devil. That's of the world that, you know, whatever. And I'm just going to keep those blinders on. And I don't think it necessarily comes from a malicious place. I think it no. comes from exactly what you're yeah. saying. It comes from a fearful place. And I, that's why I always say that the people that are coming out of these high control religions are extremely brave and courageous because to let those blinders, you know, kind of start peeking out little by little, that is a hard process because you are facing things that are overwhelming. Sometimes they can produce immense amounts of anxiety. You're blowing up your world little by little for a very long time. And it can be extremely overwhelming. Very destabilizing. Yes, absolutely. And yet, you know, you start to be like, oh, okay, this is way bigger, but also maybe way better. We start to see the gifts in doing that. Yeah. But usually we can build empathy and compassion in that too, to go, yeah, I, I remember how scary that is Like to, to yeah. actually start opening. I was up. that person that would yeah. go to people who were losing their faith, quote unquote, and yes. to try to not come from fear and sadness for mm -hmm. the, that choice they're making. I now see it as like, you said it's very courageous. It's like an act of, it's faith. It is. It actually <laughs> it is. is. It's faith. Real it's faith. the real yeah. meaning of faith. <laughs> yeah. And so to follow your actual heart, one thing that I really appreciate, I'm going to quote you from your book, high demand religions 
require individuals to divorce themselves from their bodies and move exclusively into their minds. Mm -hmm. Do you want to extrapolate on that a little? Yeah. So I believe that our bodies are invaluable pieces of wisdom. They hold so much information through our sensations and through our emotions. I think religion knows that. And so oftentimes what our bodies tell us opposes what religion tells us. And so religion then vilifies the messages and the information of our body and says, that's bad. Our body is sinful or evil, or the desires of our body are sinful and evil. So you must suppress that or oppress that, shut that down. And you have to kind of cut off like right at the neck and live from your head. And we can control that. We just tell you what to believe and kind of rewire your brain essentially. And we can control that piece and live from that space. So everything about your body equals bad. And we just pour messages into your brain. So we divorce from the body, live out of the head, and that is how we can control you. And I really believe that when we talk about the body, I think it's connected to our sexuality. I don't necessarily mean exactly who you're having sex with, though that is a part of our sexuality. Mm -hmm. I mean, the essence of who we are. As I sexual that, beings, as natural yes. sexual beings. Yeah. Yes. I believe that's the church's biggest competition mm -hmm. because that's particularly for women. Particular. Women have been at war with religion for this very reason, the yeah. natural self. Yeah. The natural sexual. Be like human. the seat of our knowing and where our power, like being empowered and embodied as human beings. And when somebody can control that, then they can control us. And so I think that somewhere along the way, church or religion figured that out and said, if we can vilify that, then, then we can control the person. And I think that's why we see so many rules around the body, around sexuality, around sex in general okay. is because of that. And so we just shut that all down and we tell you what to believe. And that gives us greater control. I'd say that was one of the most, I'm a very somatic body-based person naturally from the time I was a very little, we all are. We I all think are. I'm just yeah. a very, like a highly sensitive person. So I run things through my body and starting at 12 years old, I was sitting in a bishop's office alone and he was asking me questions about, yeah. you know, chastity and some of the stuff you brought up, I didn't even know about. I didn't even understand masturbation. My husband tells the same story. He's sitting in the bishop's office as a 12 year old at the bishops asking him if he masturbates. He's like, I figured it was bad. So I just said no, but I didn't know what it meant. He had to look it up when he got home. Yeah. And so as these innocent children were being asked, what we're doing with our bodies and what our thoughts are. And for me, it was just like you said, I had to kind of shut that down. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, when you start dating or you start, and I've mentioned this in, in other podcasts, but after my mission, so I served a full-time mission, I came home and went to BYU and started dating a guy and we had sex and I ended up getting pregnant. It wasn't a healthy relationship, mm -hmm. but not only was I, well, there's a whole scarlet letter thing with that, but I was disfellowshipped from the church. And yeah. I thought that was, I actually, that was so traumatic to sit in that council with all these men and have to detail oh. why, why I did what I did. Everything inside of me was just capitulating because I didn't want to lose my membership in the church because it was very, you know, but I stuffed a lot of that trauma of being in that council. And, you know, I was told that you know, it was a tender mercy of the Lord that I wasn't getting excommunicated and that as a punishment, they called them disciplinary councils back then. They called them membership councils. Now I was told that I could not pray at church. I could not hold a calling. I could not take the sacrament, all of these things that I was just cut off from. Mm. And it wasn't until many, many years later that I, by the way, I did place my child for adoption at the bishop's request because that's what the church said back then. If there's not a worthy priesthood holder in the home, the woman should consider adoption, which, and so I did obey that. So all mm -hmm. of this capitulation and, and everything, I just stuffed down in order to remain faithful because I needed to get back into good graces with of course. not only God, yeah. but the church. Yeah. And so many, many years later, well into my adulthood, I unpacked that as an actual trauma in my body and where of it was course. living in my body. Mm -hmm. And to try to explain that to yeah. someone who their comeback would be where you shouldn't have done that in the first place, or, 
you know, all of these comebacks around, you know, having to kind of outsource mm -hmm. to a leader or an authority. And it's always men. It was always men. Yeah. How always. do you, you probably meet people who've been disfellowshipped or excommunicated or shunned or whatever. What are the psychological ramifications of that? If it's not, if they're not able to access how it actually felt and they just kind of gloss it over and go forward as a faithful. Yeah. I mean, I've met so many people and I think too, like I've met so many people that have been disfellowshipped or excommunicated as well as people that have gone through that experience and maybe haven't gotten exactly to that point, but hold those experiences in their body also where they've had to go through some sort of a restoration process where it's like you feel the shame and that desperation of trying to get back in the good graces. Like I resonate with that so much. I was in that position as well, where it's like, you are just beholden and you're like, I will do whatever it takes yeah, because I whatever, cannot. including my firstborn. I literally Would was, you, what was your religion oh. of origin? So I grew up in what's called the evangelical free church, which is like the opposite of free. Like it's not, you know, it's, it's uh, actually the, they call it the evangelical free church is actually was the Dutch reformed church. So it's very like Calvinistic roots. So yeah, not, not free. <laughs> so you went through disfellowship so process. They don't do a formal disfellowship. They go through a disciplinary process. And I was like, right at the brink of like being, they don't call it excommunicated, but like right almost yeah. there. And then I, because I was working at the church and then I quit my job. And so that was like good enough. And then I had to go back through like this restoration process mm. because I did the thing that they wanted me to do, which was break up with this person, despite the fact that we were doing nothing wrong. I was, we're in purity culture, which we didn't call it back then, Yeah, but like, we didn't have did, the word for that back. In right. The day, right. Like we, they didn't approve of this person, but like the most we had done is he had kissed me on the hand or the forehead or something, you know, wow. like we were so pure, you know, but they were like, you are just too much for him. He lets you, you will bulldoze him. You won't respect him. And so they just, they had all these rules. And really what oh. it was is that they weren't controlling me. I was making my own decision and they didn't like that. And so when I finally did break up with him because I wanted to, not because they were telling me to, then they were like, okay, you can go back through this process of restoration, but it nearly killed me because of just what it required. Right. But you can't say no to that because you have to get back into that protective covering because it means your salvation. Like you really feel like your salvation is on the line. It's, it's one in the same. It's so over coupled, like the church and God, it's all the same, you yeah. know? Yeah. It's, and that's kind of what I'm hearing you say as well. Yeah. And, and it's a fine line when someone is thriving mm -hmm. in that space, mm -hmm. because maybe they have a certain personality or maybe they didn't get like harmful indoctrination is its whole animal. It's yeah. its whole animal. Sometimes I'm talking to somebody and all I'm hearing is the indoctrination. Like they just can't be real with me. They just have to stay faithful in their language. And, and it's really frustrating, but I honor people who are having a sense of joy, a sense of connection. But I also recognize with that too, just because I'm, I'm starting to really understand duality that yeah. they're not doing shadow work, deep, mm -hmm. deep shadow work. They're repenting. Mm -hmm. And they're kind of turning over and, and, and an obedient servant or having like a humble servant. And that's beautiful, mm -hmm. but I see a, a great denial of the shadows mm -hmm. that might be unaddressed in someone who is trying to be perfectly obedient. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there's almost an, an aura or a countenance of innocence, mm -hmm. even in their advancing years. How have you seen that play out with different people? Yeah, I think. Typically, it's not until somebody gets to a point where usually they have to take a break from that system. And I'm not one that says you have to reject religion, you have right. to become an atheist or anything like that. But I do usually find that you might need to just like put pause on it get out of the crisis situation. I say that only because it's very hard to heal. Like if you're in that system and you're constantly like moving back into the crisis, mm -hmm. it's very hard to heal. And so usually if a person can get to a point where they're like, I just need a break. 
I need to do some healing work. Mm -hmm. That's usually when they'll land in an office like mine or my colleagues. And then, then we have the opportunity to work. And it's usually years of going, I'm looking at these patterns of like, you're talking about like perfectionism or shame, which they're usually not able to name the shame because it's so ingrained into who they are. It becomes like a baseline state yes, to just it be is. in shame. Absolutely. Second guess your yeah. actions and behavior. Yeah. Like I used to think, oh, I don't deal with shame at all until I heard this one. She's not a friend of mine, but she was talking about shame. And I was like, oh, actually like, that's just how I live. That like, I just live with shame yeah. my yeah. whole entire life. That was, you know? that was my child that I talked about. Could yeah. not detach from the shame. Exactly. Yeah. That was just like, oh, that is, that's me. So it's usually, yeah, there's a lot of perfectionism, a lot of shame. They're seeing it pop up in a lot of relationships, whether that's people pleasing, a lot of codependency or over-functioning, mm -hmm. a lot of maybe like relationships that are characteristic of abuse where they're ending up in relationships with abusive partners or maybe abusive friendships, working relationships, things like that, where they're on the receiving end of that, because that's just what is their quote unquote normal. They're used to being on the receiving end of that. And they're going, why does this continue to happen to me? And so it's usually some sort of like a prompting event that gets them into this. And they're like, okay, I'm noticing this. I'm also seeing this pop up because of, or inside of like the religion that I'm a part of, or the church that I used to go to, or, you know, something like that. Yeah. So maybe they have a mental health crisis or a health crisis, or yeah. one yeah. thing I've seen is like specifically in Mormonism where yeah. um, a mother or a father will have a gay child. Yes. And they're like, wait, wait, what? Yeah. you know? Yes. That's kind of, huge. And, and then they're like, I love my child, yeah. but the mm -hmm. thought of not being with that child mm -hmm. in the afterlife, and then they just hit this pain. And yes. then they're like, wait, that is a really loving soul. Yeah. That is a child of God. I mm -hmm. can't conceive that there would be a doctrine on the table where we would not be together. Yeah. And I've seen people in that wrestle. Yeah. They would yeah. rather shun the child and put the child as a sinner then maybe look at the doctrine that's perpetuating yeah. that that child yeah. is, is not a holy person or whatever. Yes. And that is so sad to me. There's a lot of suicides that are a result of this extreme mental health issues for yeah. people who are marginalized, mm -hmm. who might be the black sheep archetype, mm -hmm. who don't really fit the mold. They're more of a free spirit. Let's just say, yeah. I guess I've kind of always been like, even when I was, you know, really immersed in, in Mormonism as, as my practice and path mm -hmm. that I was still drawing from different teachings. And I was like, you know, really kind of making this eclectic thing when it came down to my behavior mm -hmm. and, and what I needed to adhere to, there was no question in my mind that I needed to adhere to Mormon doctrine. Yeah. Absolutely. So I can see how it makes people healthy. And I can also see how it makes people very unhealthy. And that's the paradox, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And it's also, you know, kind of healthy, but at what cost type of thing? Because when we go back to that idea of sanctification, there's never an ending point. You are always having to do more. So healthy, so long as you stay in that system and never, ever, ever stop. And I would say, if that's your definition of health, okay. Like, yeah, if that, if that works yeah, for define you. Define health, right? What is healthy? Right. How would you define yeah. actual true health? <laughs> oh man, put me you on the know, spot. Right? Honestly, I and I'm not saying this as a cop out. Like that is going to be very subjective for every single person. But I, I would say, like, healthy is going to be for each person. You know, like, are you feeling fulfilled in life? Are you feeling that life is enjoyable and satisfying, and that you are living from a place of authenticity and value, and what is important to you? And, and what if you have a child that strays? Would you yeah. become unhealthy because that child took a different path? Yeah. To me, that's a marker of, yeah. you know, if you're going into a fear response through yeah. people, other people's choices and behavior or your own, that's not yeah. healthy. Yeah. And I would also say that health should be independent. This is maybe a personal preference, but I would say that health should be independent of the external factors. Like health has more to do with the internal pieces than the external pieces. So that could come from inside of me. So do I need these other things around me 
in order to be healthy mm-hmm. or can that come from within me? And the external is like the icing on the cake. That's great, right? But at the end of the day, I can also find that within myself. It's very similar to internal safety. Like, of course, I appreciate like the space that I am in, in this moment, I feel very safe. But even if I wasn't in my home right now, I could find that safety within myself and I would still be okay. And I would say there's something about health in that way too. So for the maybe highly religious or person or in a high control religion, I would say, if you didn't have your holy scriptures and these specific practices, could you feel okay and fulfilled? And if the answer to that is no, all I would say is, could you be curious about that? I'm not going to shame you for that or tell you you have to change or change like anything about you or your definitions or anything. Could you just be curious? Mm-hmm. That's all I would yeah, say. Yeah. Curiosity was my, <laughs> my downfall. <laughs> <laughs> it's everybody's, but yeah, it's yeah. like. You talk about, well, I've always, I didn't really understand spiritual bypassing for until I was in my forties. And it was actually before I stepped away from the church. I I wrestled with that concept because it was presented to me by someone in India who was one of my teachers. And, and he's like, you really need to, he never told me that I was dogmatic, Mm. that I had been adhering to programs rather than listening to my heart. But one thing he shared with me was really similar to what you did. And I'll just read this part. Cutting off emotions in high demand religion is seen as holy and godly, cutting off emotions. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of goes along with what we're talking about, having to divorce yourself from your body and disassociate and then go into your mind and remember the teachings. And so by saying you're kind of taking the spiritual practices that you were taught connect you to creator and life and love. And that you're like, there's got to be another way because I'm not feeling that. Mm-hmm. I'm constantly putting myself down. I'm constantly second guessing myself and wondering if this is okay or approved. Mm-hmm. And I, I guess I just got a little feisty that I, I was feeling controlled. I was feeling like this isn't liberation to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe it is for some people, but I once heard um, a teacher talk about how the definition of enlightenment is someone who's truly liberated. Mm. And that person scares people. Absolutely. True. Why do you think that is? That Why is that so scary? To be liberated? Yeah. Why does that freak people out? Yeah. That's somebody who's not controllable, who says <laughs> essentially like, that's cool for you, but not for me. I don't need you to tell me who I am or what to do or anything. And like, on the one hand, that's so enticing. And on the other hand, that's absolutely terrifying because that is an unpredictable person to somebody who wants to control others. To someone who has to live with predictability. I want to talk about the trauma part, because when I first heard the term religious trauma, like I said, I thought it was kind of an oxymoron. How can you be religious? And just the phrase religious trauma, that there could be, that that was oxymoronic to me, like religion and trauma, how do those two meet? And it's complex, right? Mm -hmm. So when you get that pushback, from people who are like, that's BS. How can you have religious trauma? Come on. You know, yeah. well, obviously all the stuff we're talking about is part of that complexity, but what would you say to somebody in response to that pushback? Yeah. So a couple things, I do say that religious trauma is trauma on the clinical side of things. I think that's important because I believe that we should treat religious trauma the way that we would treat any trauma. So we have great research out there. We have great modalities and interventions. I don't think that we need to necessarily recreate the wheel and come up with new modalities just for religious trauma. Mm -hmm. So I think that's hopeful and inspiring. It means that you can find some great therapists or coaches who are trained in trauma resolution modalities, hopefully body-based ones. Uh, Mm -hmm. That's my personal preference or suggestion. Even if they don't necessarily understand religious trauma or high control religions, and they can still do excellent work with you. The word religious acts a bit as an adjective to help us further understand the context where the trauma resulted from. I think in an ideal world, if you have religious trauma, you would find a therapist or a coach or somebody who understands exactly what that is. 
-hmm. But the fact of the matter is this is a bit of like an up and coming field. They don't have specific religious trauma programs in schools, but a hint is they actually don't have trauma programs in schools. Mm -hmm. You have to go do extra training for that. So, but the word religious, yeah, that just helps us better understand the context. And so I think as a clinician, that tells us where some additional recovery work is going to need to take place. When I look at that, just as a therapist, the, the trauma part, that's going to look pretty much the same from client to client, how we resolve trauma in our body, whether that's from war or developmental trauma or sexualized trauma or religious trauma, how that the physiological component is going to be relatively the same. Mm-hmm. But when we look at the recovery process, what are some of the other things that we're dealing with? boundaries and some developmental issues and things like that, that's going to be a little bit more specific to Mm -hmm. where the context happens. For instance, when I work with clients who are coming back from war, we might have to work on some things like loud noises or being in confined spaces or large crowds. Whereas maybe somebody with religious trauma, that's we're like, well, that doesn't bother me at all. But walking into Hobby Lobby and hearing worship music might really bother you. Whereas the soldier from war is like, I have no problems with that. So that helps us more with some of that recovery piece for the people who are skeptics and doubters and going, Oh, religious trauma, you know, whatever. I would say that would be an invitation also towards curiosity, asking people, tell me more about that. What is that for you? I think colloquially speaking in this country, especially religion has gotten a lot of passes in terms of being looked on very favorably from a cultural standpoint. Mm -hmm. Uh, Even politically speaking, religion has a lot of passes. We're starting to see now a lot of things coming out in the news, on social media, in documentaries of things that have been happening in churches that have gone unaddressed for decades, Mm -hmm. which is a good thing. And so we know that there's a need for this support. The problem is it's even more than what we're seeing. You know, we're hitting the high points, right? We're, we're seeing the documentaries about Warren Jeffs. We're seeing the documentaries like shiny, happy people. And then then I have to say, even with the Warren Jeffs thing, because he's an offshoot of Mormonism, right? Mormons say, well, that's just Warren Jeffs. Like that's not us. He broke away and he's doing this. It's like what they don't understand is that's an outgrowth of a set of doctrines that are not healthy. And they took some of these personalities, Mm -hmm. take that and they run with it. There's so many Mormons in the news right now that are doing some really (laughs) catching a lot of media and national attention Mm -hmm. for doing some really heinous things, Mm -hmm. taking the doctrine and spinning it. Yes. But it's the core tenets of the theology that create sort of this runaway train of getting revelation and can be really, really harmful. Absolutely. And that's where I wish people would start to be more curious to say, yeah, we're having more eyes on some of these things, but it's not just that. It's not just some of these big, quote unquote, flashy experiences It's that these are rooted into rotten doctrine and those, that doctrine is still being taught every Sunday or every Wednesday or every Saturday in churches and, you know, temples all across America. Like this is normal. And these are places that are getting tax write-offs. And these are places that are, you know, putting programs in schools and that are, you know, like receiving all sorts of benefits and are able to just take over entire cities and states. You know, I know you're- Because there's people in legislation that are adhering to these philosophies and doctrines. And so they're putting it into the legislation. Yeah, they're literally taking over our country, you know? And so that should be terrifying. I, you know, (laughs) that's a whole other conversation. But, (laughs) you know, but I think that when we can offer a curious posture- Because when we start to be like, oh, here's where it is all popping up, I think it naturally leads us to questions of, so how does that impact people? And then we can ask questions of like, oh, so then, yeah, then maybe this religious trauma thing is a thing. The other thing I like to tell people is, you know, yes, religious trauma absolutely exists. I, in particular, do not believe that everybody has trauma from religion. 
another term that some of my colleagues and I developed is called adverse religious experiences. And we created that term in lieu of spiritual abuse, only because many people seem to be resistant to using the term spiritual abuse. Abuse is a very heavy word for good reason, in terms of just the description of that. And people were going, oh, no, I wasn't abused by a clergy member. You know, like th that, that big thing didn't happen to me, which is fair. That's fine. But people started to really resonate with this term adverse religious experience. So maybe it was a purity culture type thing or, you know, some sort of altar call or something mm -hmm. that happened or some things, maybe many things that happened where they go, I don't know that I necessarily have trauma but I do know that I experienced these adverse religious experiences and they have deeply impacted me. Maybe I do have uh, significant amounts of anxiety or I really do struggle with these triggers or I do see the impact it, in my relationships or things like that. And so even if it's not resulting in trauma specifically, people are seeing the impact of high control religion in a myriad of ways. Yeah. I think it's to the point where we can't ignore it. Yeah, it is really coming up in the consciousness now of, of examining traditions. Mm -hmm. I want to wrap up with if you have somebody who's sort of, well, if you want to talk to some of our listeners who might be really just maybe starting to open up, like you said, taking the blinders off just a little bit and looking at like asking what is really true and true and true and true all the way down. And deconstruction can lead all the way to atheism. And you and I are both on the same page that that's also fundamentalism just as much as strict, yeah. you know, religious stuff. So let's say that you learned as a child from religion that you were supposed to kind of fear God mm -hmm. and also love God and that you're also supposed to love yourself, but kind of detest yourself at the same time. And so some of that mixed messaging can split the psyche. Yeah. That's definitely what happened to me. What would you say to somebody who may be kind of to wake up to, you know, what does it mean to have unconditional regard for yourself, for life, for others, for God? How does that butt up against some of my programming? And they're just starting to kind of take those blinders off and look at it in an honest way. What would you say to them as kind of a supportive way to continue that deconstruction? Because I wasn't supported in my deconstruction at the beginning. I just went into isolation. Sure, sure. Yeah. <laughs> but it was really meaningful to get that support. But I would have gotten it sooner than later is what I'm saying. So how would you bring people into that without it being so overwhelming or taxing on their nervous system even more? Yeah, there's a few kind of words or concepts that come to mind. One we've kind of talked about already is like the permission to be curious and curiosity by nature should not have shame attached to it. But I think it's worth noting like mm -hmm. curiosity without shame, because I think so often when we're in this space, it's really natural to be like, oh my gosh, why didn't I see that? Or I can't believe that I believe that or did that or whatever. And if we can remove that piece of it and just like, oh, wow, I noticed this. I, whoa, I'm seeing this for the first time or or just giving yourself space to ask, well, what, what if I thought about this differently? Or what if I looked at this? Just some spaciousness within that curiosity, I think can be so helpful and not judging or shaming yourself for it. Mm -hmm. Reminding yourself that for so many of us, especially when we grew up in it, we would not have had access to anything else. So this is all brand new information. So beating yourself up for it, not helpful. Creating just more shame. Yeah. You know, it's not yeah. a, good, it's a good, yeah. way to go about it. Absolutely. Well, I, yeah, I love that curiosity mm -hmm. piece. I think it's integral to coming back into a space of just opening yourself the expansive way rather than the constricted way. Yeah. That that's a big piece of this, the expansiveness around that, you know, yeah. you're coming into like, oh, wow, I have bypassed mm -hmm. in order to stay faithful which mm -hmm. is in and of itself a complete yeah. you know, split. Yeah, yeah. So, so getting the right support comes in here too. So you're curious and then you're asking and you're going deep and you're being honest with yourself. I think that is so helpful. One of the first things I did, because I didn't have support at first either, was learning self-compassion. It's so, which is the exact opposite of everything we're taught inside religion. I... Yeah, I had a, a mentor friend of mine who recommended the book called Self-Compassion by Kristen Neff. 
And I was actually looking at it for a client, but I had a, a rule for myself that I was like, if I'm going to recommend anything to clients, I have to read it first. And I was so glad I did because it really changed my life. I realized within the first chapter, this is so different than anything I've ever been taught inside of religion. I think I need to go through this myself. And it helped me start paying attention to the things that I was saying to myself. And it really was just highlighting all the critical messages that religion was teaching me. And for me, that was just incredibly helpful to start replacing some of the judgment, some of the self-criticism and truly the self-hatred that was just like the tape in my mind yeah. constantly running. And I will forever say like, even before I started doing body-based trauma work, like, that was my first step into trauma work was really learning how to be compassionate towards mm, myself. Really powerful. Yeah. And to this day, I am, I'm a forever changed person because of the self-compassion work that I Kristen did. Kristen Neff is a powerhouse and she's, she has powerful stuff on depression. Yes. And yeah. Like the chronic self-inadequacy that you feel when you have that programming and the shame. And like I said, I wore that scarlet letter for decades. Yes. Yeah. I was also told that I would never have a high church calling just because of what happened in my twenties and yeah. just being a normal college girl, I guess. And I would say normal college girl. I was a purity culture college right? girl yeah. who like <laughs> had a problem, just a brief problem there, but yeah. Okay. So self-compassion, curiosity, yeah. is there anything and else? Patience. Mm. People don't understand. This is an all encompassing identity shaking process. There is no part of high control religion that, that doesn't touch your life. And so to be patient with yourself, to be patient with this process, it is going to take time. It's going to take time to change things and to be patient with yourself. It just, it simply cannot happen by next week or the week after it's going to take time. And within that to remember, it's not always going to be this way. I, I can remember periods of time where I'm like, oh my goodness, this is all I can think about. It's all I can, you know, all I'm talking about. It's all that. I can, what is it? Eat, sleep, breathe, read. Like it was everything. And I'm decades past that point now. And I have a big full life where this is, you know, like, obviously this is what I do for my job, but I have an off switch. And then I have this big, beautiful life outside of that. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm so like, I love everything I do inside my job and I love everything I do outside of my job. So it's not going to be like this forever, but be patient because for a while it does feel very all encompassing. So yeah. So to be patient with yourself and to be patient with this process. And then I know you had said it earlier, if there's ways to get support around you, maybe that is finding online communities or, you know, following Instagram accounts, reading books, listening to podcasts. So you literally think you're going crazy. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you kind of are. Yeah, of course. And then the yeah. people at church are like, your countenance is so fallen. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. well, um, yeah. my whole worldview just broke apart. I'm Completely. a little, I'm a little crazy. Yeah. yeah. And I remember when I started going through this process, it was back in like the early 2000s. So social media was not a thing. We didn't have podcasts, anything like that. I, not in an egotistical way, I really thought I was the only one going through this because that's what we are taught. Yeah. If you're questioning your faith, that's on you. And so mm -hmm. I was very private about it. I didn't have anybody to talk to. And when I finally found, um, what well, was two other friends, they were married, um, that were going through this also. I mean, we would have like secret meetings where we would drink margaritas and talk about the show Big Love on HBO because we're like, <laughs> were oh those my gosh. Mormons, the big yes, love people? Yeah. Okay. But it was, but we could draw the connections. We're yeah. like, oh my gosh, like this is what we were taught to. And like we could talk, we had this common language that we could talk about. And we were like, do you think other people are going through this also? You know, it was, it was such a relief. And then social media started to come around and things like that. And there was just this new part that was healed when other people started talking about it, when I could start working with a therapist about it, when I could 
you know, talk in large groups about it, things like that. Mm -hmm. And so there really is something beautiful about being able to find support and maybe going to therapy or coaching or whatever. Maybe that's not for everybody for a variety of reasons, but there are free online communities. You can scroll Instagram or TikTok Mm -hmm. or whatever, and at least know that you're not alone. Mm -hmm. That piece is really huge because high control religions will do everything they can to tell you this is a you problem. And you need to know it's not, it's not you. It's a systemic issue. Yeah. And there are other people that are on this journey with you. You're not alone. And there are people that are ready to be like, Hey, we got you. Yeah. We're with you. That validation piece is so pivotal because there are other people that are, I have to say too, that some of the, the groups that I found online, they were still swirling in trauma and yes. so they were very projecting <laughs> and blaming and things. And so <laughs> they're cut to a point where I'm like, I'm not sure this is the healthiest community for me, yes. but I honor that they are swirling in trauma. Yeah. They have yes. a lot of anger and betrayal that they're working through. And then yes. also, like you said, finding a therapist who's really trauma informed. Mm-hmm. I actually had to find somebody who was trauma informed with the complexities of Mormon doctrine. Yes. Yeah, because it was a specific for me anyway, I'm not saying that, but that it was a very specific and like she basically said, just looked at me eye and she says, you are talking from deep programming. And for her to say that it just for whatever reason, it just blew those blinders off. Yeah, I I really am. I'm, I'm talking from my programming, not from my authenticity. We'll round this out because I could keep talking to you. I know we've been talking. Are you familiar with the work of Dr. Gabor Mate? Yes. The trauma. Mm-hmm. So, so we'll end with this and I want your take on that and you can tell people where to find you after this. But one of the things when he talks about complex trauma, he says the worst kind of complex trauma is denying your authenticity over time, chronically denying your authenticity over time to capitulate yeah. to what others want for you. And you can't authentically be you or have a voice. And I yeah. thought that was, that was actually really validating to follow his work. Cause he doesn't yeah. really talk about religious trauma. He talks about yeah. just the trauma that humans normally carry, but that he said is the worst one. It's the, it's the most complex and it's the most harmful is to chronically defer your authenticity and outsource it and not claim it for yourself. Yeah. Which feels so similar. I mean, that feels like the crux of what so many high control religions teach. I done a lot of training in somatic experiencing. I've gone through their three year program and the creator of that is Peter Levine one of the things he talks about is like the little statement he says is healing trauma is coming home to yourself and your inherent goodness, which feels very much what Gabor Mate is saying is that authenticity piece, which feels like it flies in the face of what high control religions teach. You know, the self is bad and evil and sinful. Deny the self, deny the self, yeah. deny the self. Yeah. Here's these two doctors, you know, saying like, no, 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 no. That actually is so harmful. It is all about coming back to your inherent goodness, your authentic self. And that is where the healing is. And I, I think that that's, I, I could not agree more. You know, that is, mm. that's what. That really resonates. It just yeah. like hits you like, ooh. Yeah. Well, Dr. Laura, where can people find you and your offerings? What are you bringing forward these days? Yeah. So I actually, um, I'm the founder and CEO of a company called the Center for Trauma Resolution and Recovery. And we actually do online trauma coaching for clients all over the world who are coming out of high control religion, fundamentalism, purity culture, adverse religious experiences for this very reason, because it can be very difficult to find trauma informed, you know, with people who understand religious trauma and who are trained in body-based trauma resolution modalities. So yeah, I, I founded that. And so there's people that are ready to work with, with you. If that is somebody or something that you're interested in, everything is online. So you can access it from wherever you're at. Uh, we, are at trauma resolution and recovery.com, or you can find us on Instagram at that same handle trauma resolution and recovery. You can find me across all social media platforms, Dr. Laura E. Anderson. And then my website is Dr. Laura E. Anderson.com. I do what I call mini intensives. That's the way that I can kind of stay connected to clients. So there are two hour blocks of time that you can sign up for to work with me, just kind of one shot opportunities. And then if you need additional support, I'm happy to refer you on. And then of course my book is available wherever you purchase books when religion hurts you. Mm. 
Yeah. Oh, and I'm for anybody who's interested, I'm offering a year long course right now. You can jump in at any time. It's a self led course. It's called uh, Religious Trauma and Politics because we're Ooh. in a, a political year, election cycle year. So there are several modules that are already out, but you can go back and do them at your own pace. And whenever you jump in, we drop new modules on the first and 15th of every month. Wow. So yeah, it's just a way to kind of support you as, as the election cycle ramps up and it's, I'm not telling people how to vote or who to vote for or anything like that, but it's just mm -hmm. things of, you know, kind of how to, you know, how to deal with triggers around religious trauma, trusting yourself, yeah, navigating embodied boundaries, you know, mm -hmm. how to have conversations with people who like to make everything political, dealing with family and friends, mm -hmm. all that stuff. So mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, I just honor you for the work you're doing and, and you. kind of, you know, you, you collated things and you're staying relevant with this issue, which I really appreciate. So I think I would encourage people if they sort of are on that precipice of trying to understand their feelings and what they're experiencing to not go into that isolation, to find yeah. the support. So mm -hmm. thank you for your time and thank you for thank your you. work so much. Thank you. It was so fun to be on today. Hey, it's Cherie here. Have you gotten my free whole body healing kit mini course? All you have to do is ask to join our private Facebook group, Soul Rose Community, and we'll send it right to your inbox. And I want you to know that I am so grateful for every single one of you who listens to these episodes. You can follow me on Instagram at Cherie.Burton to deepen into the discussion that you heard today. And I would be ever so grateful if you would leave this podcast a positive review on Apple Podcasts. This allows many more people to find these kinds of healing and empowerment gems that we bring forward in our discussions. And if you want to see our faces, check out my Soul Rose Show YouTube channel. Have a glorious week, and we'll talk to you next time on the Soul Rose Show.